The next step uh, in this course uh, in doing meta-analysis is that you have to examine heterogeneity. So what I, what I will say here is I will first explain what heterogeneity is, then I will say something about how you can examine causes, possible causes of heterogeneity, and then I will say something about publication bias. Publication bias is not directly related to heterogeneity, but I didn't know where else to put it in this course, so I'll talk about it here. Um, so what is heterogeneity? Well, this is the, the uh, formally the statistical heterogeneity is the variability in the intervention effects being evaluated in the different studies. But what it means is that you uh, that what you do when you look at heterogeneity is that you suppose you have just a random uh, collection of effect sizes, which are, you know, there are just effect sizes which have nothing to do with each other. And if you would plot it on a, on a screen, you would see no connection between them. If that's the case, then you have 100% heterogeneity. If you see that these effect sizes are related to each other, pointing in the same direction, large studies more precisely going to that mean effect size and small studies differing somewhat more, but they all point in the same direction, then that sample of study is homogeneous and there is no heterogeneity. That's, I think, the best way to understand what it means. Statistical heterogeneity, so the, the relationship between these effect sizes, that's really a statistical issue. It's something different from clinical heterogeneity. So you can, you can have a collection of effect sizes uh, which are statistically not heterogeneous, but then if you look at the studies, there may be all kinds of clinical uh, heterog heterogeneous issues different patients, this, different therapists, uh, the contents of the therapy is different, the recruitment uh, is different, but that's, that's clinical heterogeneity. How do you think from a clinical a contents point of view how these studies differ from each other? But statistical heterogeneity is easier because we can examine that. So heterogeneity is important because if there is no heterogeneity, it makes sense to look at these studies as one group of studies and pool, uh, make one pooled effect size. If you do have heterogeneity, then there is something that makes these studies different from each other. And they do not all point in the same direction. Uh, um, and you can use, in such a case, the random effects model because that allows for individual studies to have some more variance, some more difference from the other studies. But uh, you, you, if these studies differ from each other to a certain extent, you want to know why. And um, that is very important because suppose you do a meta-analysis. We did a meta-analysis, for example, on problem solving for depression a couple of years ago. And we found that problem solving for depression was effective. It had a very good effect size, nothing very different from other psychological treatments for depression. But what we also found is that heterogeneity was very high. And we did all kinds of analysis, uh, subgroup analysis, looking at outliers, looking at moderators, meta regression analysis, but we could not find a reason for that heterogeneity. So what we, the only conclusion then, uh, what you can draw is that you can say, well, basically problem solving may be effective, but it's also possible that if you do it, that it's not effective or the effects are much smaller. And we cannot predict when the effect size are larger and smaller. So basically such a, uh, this, this is a, then you cannot say anything about the effects of problem solving. And that's the problem of heterogeneity. So in any meta-analysis you do, heterogeneity is a key concept. You have to examine heterogeneity. And if you find it, you have to examine possible sources 
of heterogeneity. So how do you do that? How do you examine uh, heterogeneity? Well, you can look at outliers, you can do subgroup analysis, moderator analysis, or you can do meta-regression analysis. And I'll ex explain the basic principles of these things too. So, but first, how do you examine whether there's heterogeneity? So how can you examine in your data whether there is heterogeneity or not? Well, first you can look to the forest plot. Then you can do a test for heterogeneity. Is there significant heterogeneity? And the third is that you can quantify heterogeneity by I square, which is an indication of heterogeneity in percentages. So first, the visual inspection of the forest plot. What you do is you just look at the forest plot and you look at uh, do they point in the same direction. And I will give a few examples of this. This is a meta-analysis we published in Psychological Medicine in which we compared psychotherapy with pill placebo. And what you see here is that the effect, all the effect sizes, the 95 confidence interval of the effect sizes overlap. The effect sizes do not differ that much from each other and they all point about in the same direction. You see that at the uh, at the, at the left down in the screen also that I square was 0%. So there's no indication of significant heterogeneity. But you also have to remember here that this is very depending on the confidence interval. And you still see that the 95 confidence interval around I square is quite large. And that has to do with the fact that the number of studies is quite small. So we assume there's no heterogeneity, but we're not absolutely certain. Here you see another study we published uh, in Maturitas on psychotherapy for depression in older adults. And if you look at these effect sizes, I would, if I look at this, this, is, uh, this they differ much more from each other than in the previous plot. For example, the Fry 1983 study, the effect size is not even on the screen. So it's somewhere in the, uh, it's more higher than three, which is a not credible effect size. But that's what the, what the paper said. And you, so for example, you, if you look at the pooled effect size and the red lines indicate the 95 confidence interval around the pooled effect size. And if you then look at, for example, outliers, you see there are quite some outliers and indicating that these studies, you know, they, they're in both ways, positive and negative. And so there are all kinds of differences between those studies. And if you again look at I square at the lower left side of the screen, you again, you here see that the I square was 80% and uh, uh, highly significant. The next thing is that you can do a test of homogeneity. So this test, it's a Q-test, and it indicates whether there is significant heterogeneity. Most uh, software for meta-analysis do this standard. And so you get a Q-value and you get a P-value whether indicating whether there, is whether there is significant heterogeneity. The Q-test is getting less and less used nowadays because it's uh, the problem with the Q-test and the significance value of, of it is that it's very depending on the number of trials. So if you only have, a f have 10 or 15 trials, uh, then you may find that there is no heterogeneity, but that just indicates that the number of trials is very small and uh, you, there is no way to solve it, and then you find there is no, your, your, your uh, Q-test is not significant, suggesting that there is no uh, heterogeneity, but in fact you don't know because the number of studies is so small. So what is used more and more is that is the I-square uh, statistic. And I-square is just the proportion of the total variance that can be explained by heterogeneity. And a, a rough indication is that if you have 
uh, that's low heterogeneity, 50% is moderate, and 75 and higher is high heterogeneity. If you have heterogeneity of, let's say, 75%, that just indicates that they, these studies are not very related to each other, and they, they're almost random effect sizes. Since a few years, we also stimulate that you also calculate the 95 confidence interval around I square. Because again, if the numbers of studies is small and you get, you get let's say, a 95, you get an I square of zero, then it's still the, the 95 confidence interval can be so broad that can range from uh, zero to 80. So you find a heterogeneity, an I square of zero, but because the 95 confidence interval goes up to 80%, then uh, it's still very well possible that you have high levels of heterogeneity. You just don't know because the uncertainty is too high. So again here, you see this is the first slide, the first example I showed. And here's heterogeneity is 0%, but the confidence interval goes from 0 to 58%. And so it's still very well possible that there's moderate heterogeneity. So if you have heterogeneity, how can you examine the causes of heterogeneity? So you, you, one thing you can do is moderator analysis. And what you do in moderator analysis is that you examine the association between a characteristic of a study and the effect size. And that may explain heterogeneity. But you have to remember this is always indirect evidence. I will show it later. There are different types of moderator analysis. You can do subgroup analysis. Um, you take two groups of studies, two subgroups of your whole sample of studies, and you examine whether these two subgroups differ significantly from each other. You can do bivariate matter regression analysis in which you examine, for example, a, the, the association between a continuous outcome and the effect size. I will show later how an example of this. And you can do multivariate matter regression analysis. And that's just basically the same as a normal regression analysis. You can enter continuous variables and dummy variables, and you can adjust for all the variables in one large model. So subgroup analysis. Um, if you do subgroup analysis, so you make subgroups within your whole sample of studies and examine whether these two or three or four subgroups differ significantly from each, from each other, what you hope is that you get, if you have high heterogeneity for the full sample of studies, what you hope is that you get, get different effect sizes for the subgroups, and that within each of these subgroups, heterogeneity is low. That's, that's the ideal picture. It almost never happens. That's my experience. But that's what you, what you would like to see if you do these analysis. You can do these subgroup analysis using two uh, methods. You can use either the mixed effect, a mixed effects model in which you calculate effect sizes within the subgroup according to the random effects mo model, but test the, whether the, the, the effect sizes between the subgroups are significant with a fixed effects model. You can also use a fixed effects model for both the within group effect sizes and the difference between subgroups. Personally, I think in psychological treatments, again, you should use the mixed effects model. It's very, there is no good rule for which variables you should include in subgroup analysis. Um, it very much depends on the number of studies uh, you have, uh, the number of uh, 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 characteristics you would like to examine, uh, so if you have only 10 studies, it makes no sense to do five subgroup analysis because then you, you have more analysis than you have, than you have, uh, on, than you have studies at some point. So, don't, you should, so if you have 10 studies, you shouldn't do more than three 
a moderator analysis and it's very difficult to make a good judgment on what the moderators moderators are you you want to examine but if the number of study increases you can do more and more analysis and at least one of the things you should examine always is the difference is the effect of the validity or the quality of the study on your in your sample so this is a uh, uh, this is a meta analysis we did a couple of years ago on internet cbt with or without support uh, compared to control groups so we collected all the studies uh, on internet therapy whether they had personal support or not uh, in which that internet therapy was compared with a control group and we did a meta analysis of that and we found that the overall effect size was 0.41 but we also found a quite high level of heterogeneity so we did all kinds of subgroup analysis and one of the subgroup analysis was the most interesting one and I, I've, you, you can see it here we found a difference between studies in which the internet CBT was delivered with professional support and one without professional support so when there was no professional support you, you should you go to that website and walk through that intervention without any support completely on yourself and you do just do all the modules etc etc so what we found is a strong diff significant difference between the groups of studies with professional support and those without professional support and we also found that heterogeneity within these subgroups was very small as i said this not really often happens usually when you do subgroup analysis they're not as nice as you, as you would like but this was a good example that it worked out quite well the other thing you can do is you can, can do bivariate meta regression analysis and then you don't work with subgroups but you work with continuous variables uh, so what you do then is you examine the association between the effect size and the continuous characteristic of each of the studies for example um, quality score number of treatment sessions the year in which the study was conducted things like that so I, this is a um, uh, an example we calculated pre post effect sizes for studies on psychotherapy for chronic depression and what you see here the circles are the um, uh, uh, the, the, the individual studies um, and you just see a regression line uh, through it with the number of sessions on the horizontal axis the effect size on the vertical axis and you see that the effect size goes up with each additional uh, session this is a good example uh, of uh, meta regression analysis and what it, what you see is that the slope just indicates the association between the effect size and uh, the number of treatment sessions and what is interesting is the slope so the slope was in this example was 0.04 indicating that with each additional session the effect size increases with 0.04 you can also do multivariate meta regression analysis so you then you just enter all those characteristics of those studies into one large multivariate model you can use continuous outcomes and dummy variables just as what you do in a normal non meta analytic regression analysis so what we did here what you see here is a meta analysis which we did uh, some time ago in which we looked at the association between the effect size uh, of studies in psychotherapy for older adults with all with a series of characteristics of those trials and this is just a normal outcome uh, of these uh, of such a multivariate analysis okay publication bias which is not really related to examining heterogeneity but it is an important issue when you do meta-analysis
Publication bias refers to the phenom phenomenon that studies are just not published. And uh, if you do a meta-analysis of published studies and studies with negative or zero findings are not included, you're inclined to overestimate the pooled effect size, which is in fact smaller than uh, reality, than the true effect size. So we know that this affects the outcomes of meta-analysis and it's it's, we do not know exactly the causes of this. We know, for example, in uh, uh, Eric Turner wrote an, in 2008 an important paper in uh, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine in which he compared trials published on antidepressive medication from peer-reviewed journals and he looked into the database from the Food and Drug Administration in the United States where pharmaceutical companies have to uh, uh, submit data on trials to get uh, medications accepted to the American market. Uh, so, and some of those studies were not published. So he compared the published studies to the studies in the FDA database and he found clear and significant differences. But who, what the exact causes are, are is not clear. So that can be the, you know, the companies who are, have a clear commercial interest in getting the positive findings on medication published and they want to ignore the negative findings. But it's also the, the journals who are often more interested in uh, positive outcomes than in negative outcomes. And it's also for authors often the case that they like to find positive and significant outcomes and are inclined just to forget or do not publish the results of trials with less positive results. But that's all, all may cause publication bias and that's a major problem in meta-analysis. In, in the field of psychology, uh, we do not have an FDA where unpublished trials are submitted. There are, so we have to look at it indirectly. There are some ways to do it directly, by, but I won't go into that now. But you can, uh, we can examine publication bias indirectly just by looking at the data. So I want to show you how you can do that. Uh, and I, I will first give an example of a paper we published a couple of years ago on 117 studies on psychotherapy for adult depression. So I'll, I will first show um, uh, show how it works. Well, this is a what you see on the horizontal axis is the effect size, and what you see on the vertical axis is the standard error, which is an indication of the size of the study. So the more patients are included in uh, the study, the smaller the standard error is. Um, so in the top of this plot, you see the studies with many participants. And the more down, you see the studies with smaller numbers of participants. Uh, if you look at it from this, this perspective, what you, what, you, what you see is, well, if studies, are small, if studies are, have more participants, you assume that, that, that those effect size are more near to the pooled effect size. So they, they give a more precise estimate of the effect size because they have more participants, so they, they can be more precise. If you have smaller numbers of participants, then you can assume that the effect size diverts more from the pooled effect size because the, eff the, f the effect size you find are not that precise as from large studies, so they may divert more from uh, the, uh, uh, the pooled effect size. But if you look at it from that way, then the smaller the study gets, they may divert more from the pooled effect size, but that diversion should be in both directions. So you should have studies with positive deviations of the mean effect size, but you should have the same number of studies in the negative direction. And as you can see from this plot, um, that the studies, the small studies, with large effect sizes are on the right lower quadrant of this uh, graph, but then the lower downside, there, these studies should also be there, but they're not there. And they should be there, assuming 
uh, this, uh, that this forest plot should be, uh, this funnel plot should be uh, symmetrical. So you can see only by looking at this plot that there is publication bias. You can, there are all, CMA, for example, allows you to quantify this publication bias. So they, there is a method to impute the studies that should have been there but are not really there. And then you get a graph like this. And what you see here is that you have all kinds of studies. Uh, the black dots indicate the studies that should have been there but are not really there. And they are, um, if you adjust for these studies, which are, I think, 51 for something like that, um, uh, missing in this example, and that, uh, that, that reduces the effect size quite considerably. So we can, by looking at the symmetry of this funnel plot, you can get an indication of the impact of publication bias on the outcomes in your meta-analysis. Uh, there are also all kinds of tests to examine whether the funnel plot is symmetrical or not. So the Duval and Tweedy's trim and fill procedure just imputes the missing studies and calculates an effect, effect size which is adjusted for these missing studies. Other tests like uh, Beckham, Azumbar or Eggers test, uh, they just test whether the, fu the, the funnel plot is symmetrical or not. So here we found that the unadjusted effect size was 0.67, but if you adjust for publication bias, the effect size was reduced to 0.41, and we missed 51 studies. And we also found that Eggers and Beckham Azumbar's tests are very significant. So key points here. Heterogeneity is a key concept in any meta-analysis, and it's the variability in the intervention effects in the different studies. And it's the level of heterogeneity is key to interpreting the outcomes of the pooled effect size. You can examine it by all kinds of methods, uh, moderator analysis, subgroup analysis, meta-regression analysis, looking at outliers, um, and uh, another key issue for doing meta-analysis is publication bias. And if you do a meta-analysis, you should look at the risk of publication bias as well.